info at astrosociety.org. Well, I'm very happy to uh, bring to us tonight uh, Dr. Pamela Gay. She's an astronomer, writer, and podcaster focused on using new media to engage people in science and technology. Through CosmoQuest.org, she works to engage people in both learning and doing science. Join her as we map our solar system in unprecedented detail through our citizen science projects and learn astronomy through media productions like Astronomy Cast. Through this weekly podcast, Fraser Kane and Dr. Gay take you on a facts-based journey through our cosmos, exploring not only what we know, but how we know it. And she's coming to us fresh from another hangout, and so uh, um, I feel very... Uh, um, happy to introduce Dr. Pamela Gay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I do have the question window open, and I also have the chat window open. Uh, so feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, Brian asked me to come on this evening and talk to you about how you can leverage the CosmoQuest platform to help out with your night sky night night sky network activities. Um, I, I know that inevitably when I go outside to do events, um, I, I bring the clouds. It's, it's what I do. People don't believe me when I say this and then they invite me to star parties and it rains for three days. Um, this is why I work on the internet. It's not the only reason, but what, what I've learned is while the clouds may roll in, uh, quite often we can still get online and engage people in the night sky using technology, even in these worst case situations. So I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this community that we've built. Um, I'm going to screen share my screen and this may cause your local screen to go a little bit haywire. I apologize if that just happened to you. Um, so, so CosmoQuest is, is a project that we built back in 2012 to try and handle the modern data flood that we have. Now, this is something that we don't think about a lot, but just how we study our universe is radically changing. A little over 50 years ago, when Mariner missions first went out exploring our solar system, the, the first data we got back from a uh, world other than our own that wasn't just reflected light in a telescope was a temperature measurement of Venus. Now, if you go back and you read science fiction that was written prior to the spacecraft, uh, you'll find that people had their hopes and dreams set on Venus being this tropical paradise that maybe someday we could go to and hang out with the Venusians. And when that first piece of data came back, well, science crushed a whole lot of dreams while creating new ones. It turns out that Venus is like 900 degrees and a little hot to call a tropical paradise. Um, but, but we're not here to talk about Venus. We're here to talk about that data. And the thing about that data is when we got it back, the spacecraft was only capable of holding about 600 bytes of information. Now, one byte is roughly one character. And if you're on Twitter, you have probably tweeted more than 600 bytes in any given day and probably tens of times that during any particular political debate if you happen to be engaged in politics. The amount of data that spacecrafts could originally hold was so small that a typical science team would get all of the data down from the spacecraft quickly chew through all of it, and then they pretty soon have all of their results, and there was really nothing to do until perhaps new software came along that maybe allowed new processing to take place. Today, the picture is a little bit different. The Solar Dynamic Orbiter is taking pictures at a very high cadence of the sun. This allows us to make amazing movies of things like this coronal mass ejection shooting out from the surface and to study all of the intricate interplays between the plasma and the magnetic fields and everything else. And as this data comes back to Earth, it's coming back at a little less than a terabyte most days, a little bit more than a terabyte other days. It depends on what cameras we're downloading data from. Either way, 
we are getting more data back each day than scientists have the ability to go through and fully analyze at the rate that it's coming down. We, we do what we can using software, but it's very hard to write software that goes through images and looks for things we don't know exist yet. And the most amazing discoveries are going to be the ones that come from someone looking at the images. And I, I have to say, it's generally looking with eyeballs at the images and going, there is something completely unexpected in what's going on here. And as science gets to the point that the data pouring down on us is creating a flood that prevents us from completing science, we're having to find new solutions. And when I say that the data is raining down on us, I mean this quite literally. This is a screen capture from earlier this evening when the Deep Space Network was, well, capturing images, uh, not images, capturing the data that was coming back from, well, Voyager 1 uh, was getting received on two different antennas, and there's both sending and receiving on a third antenna. Uh, they were getting data and sending data to Cassini and OSIRIS-REx, and well, as, as we're studying all of this data that is literally raining down on us from the sky, um, we have to figure out how to deal with all of it. And globally, there's only about 10,000 astronomers. And at a certain point, we have to say, we need help. And, and many of you as, as amateur astronomers know that professional astronomers quite often reach out and say, can you look at these novas for us? Can you look at uh, these variable stars for us? Can you help us with your backyard telescopes better study our sky? Well, with, with CosmoQuest, we're not asking you to go out with your telescopes. We're, we're instead asking you to come onto our website and join us in a virtual research center and, and help us handle this flood of data that's raining down upon us. Now, the, the idea behind all of this uh, I have to say, actually comes in large part from Fraser Kane, who's the publisher of Universe Today. He and I have been working together on Astronomy Cast for 10 years now. And he's, he's pretty much been saying since day one, why is it that all of you academics in your ivory tower don't just let the public have free access to everything that you're doing with our tax dollars? Well, he's Canadian, so it's not his tax dollars. Uh, but, but the point is still there. He wanted to know why is it that we don't have completely open access to our data, to our seminars, to our classes, and this became particu particularly irksome as we began to launch citizen science projects. So I was part of the early days of the Zooniverse, and, and the question became, why is it that you're inviting us in to help you out with all of these citizen science projects while you sit in your ivory tower. Can we please have full access? And for a long time, the, the, the answer was always money. We don't have web streaming equipment that's free, like we now have with Google Hangouts, YouTube Live, and using low-cost uh, things like Zoom. Uh, and as software got better and servers got cheaper, he and I sat down and realized we could brainstorm all of the things we ever dreamed of having in a research facility and put them together and launch it live and free for the public. So we brainstormed what are the things that, that we would want um, and, and who doesn't want a planetarium and there's classes to teach and, well, observing is is amazing and so we had the virtual star parties and there's media because we want to bring the experience of being able to go to a seminar to our audiences and there's data projects and resources and well of course there's accounting but that's mostly me so you're free from that um, and we took all of these things that we brainstormed that would be necessary and I searched through a list of what domains were available to be purchased. And at the end of this brainstorming and this searching for a name, we ended up with CosmoQuest. And today, CosmoQuest exists as a project that 
is strangely being shown with a bunch of yellow lines. Please ignore the yellow lines. Um, and, and this project um, that, that we have has, uh, it has eight main components. And, and these eight main components uh, are, are the citizen science project that you can participate in. We're getting ready to launch uh, S. Roses and the Ideas Repository. This is NASA acronyms for science fair stuff. Uh, when this appears on our website, it's S. Roses is Student Research Opportunities in Space and Earth Science, but we're just going to label that DIY science. And these are going to be activities that you can do with your kids, you can do with your club members that get you using actual NASA data to do research that, well, you're doing on your own. We have classes for kids, classes for adults, but... I think the thing that matters most to this audience is how can you get involved in the citizen science activities? So in general, our citizen science projects, they're designed for ages 10 and up. So if you're having a cloudy night and you happen to have an internet connection and you happen to have five-year-olds, we are not the place to go. Um, but for ages 10 and up, kids who have a bit of dexterity, we have projects where you can come and help us map out other worlds. Uh, this is our current interface as of today. As of tomorrow, we may have a different interface. We're in the process of doing massive upgrades to our website, and I was hoping that all of those would be live for tonight, but as any of you who are software developers know, uh, it's sometimes hard to get things launched exactly on time when you're trying to do innovative things. Um, so, so with our, our interface, there's a tutorial that you can have set up that people can go through and, and the software teaches them how to do it. So this can also be the, oh my gosh, this child, this human is asking me constant questions. Here, go do this. Um, as, as someone who uh, goes out and does uh, nights at our museum once a month uh, next to our local Night Sky Network chapter, I know that there's often these moments where you have that one person and you need something to get them busy. Citizen science can be that thing. Um, so there's a tutorial. Once they go through the tutorial, um, there's an activity that they can do. They can go through and using the drawing tools in this image, they can mark out the craters. They can, in images that have boulders, mark those out. And these are highest resolution images available for each of these projects. And in some cases, no human being has ever actually taken the time to look at the particular image these people are looking at, at its full resolution. If, if you think about it, for our lunar projects, we have a resolution of about a half meter per pixel. And that means that if you're six foot tall and lay down on the moon and assumed snow angel position, you would appear as being one or two pixels wide and two pixels long in these images of the moon, which basically would make you look like a grain of pepper on the moon, but you'd be visible. And when you start thinking about mapping the moon out at this kind of resolution where humans start to be something you can see, it starts to become the kind of project where you realize no one scientist can do this. No one team of scientists can do it. And we're not just looking at the moon. We're looking at the moon and Mars and Vesta and Mercury. And we're adding new worlds and new projects on a regular basis. And the only way we're going to be able to map out all of these worlds is if we get your help. And, and so suddenly the... How do I get this human being who is standing in front of me and won't stop talking to stop getting in the way of me helping all these other people? We can take that person and leverage their enthusiasm by getting them to map out another planet, getting their, their attention focused on something that suddenly has amazing purpose. 
And, and when it's cloudy and we have that person who's like, I drove all the way out here, which you mean I can't look at the moon. And sometimes they say this, even though there's a thunderstorm going on, when you want to take that person and, and get their enthusiasm built back up when the clouds have crushed it down, this is a way you can say, here, let's go online. You can make a difference. And then with all of you personally, if you're like me, you sometimes find yourself sitting on the sofa with your spouse who's watching something on TV that, that you're not quite sure why they're watching, but because you love your spouse, you're going to watch it with them. This is when the computer comes out and when I map other worlds. Mapping other worlds can suddenly be that thing we do to give moments that otherwise might be spent checking what's on our Facebook feed and playing whatever is the latest game of choice on our phone, we can take these moments and give them purpose. So, so there's a tutorial, there's an activity you can do, and we provide feedback with, with our Moon Mappers project. Uh, every few images, it's going to come back and tell you how what you did compares with how a professional did, marking the exact same image. So you can learn through your mistakes. You can learn what are the things that you're missing. And, and as you learn, because different people who are at different stages in learning are all looking at the same images. We, we get 15 different people to look at every single image because it's the efforts of 15 people working together. The things that you mark added with, together with the things that other people mark, we find has a group perfection that is the same as getting a group of professionals to mark things. Because it turns out, just like you may get distracted by the phone ringing halfway through marking an image, well, the pros get distracted too. And by us working together, we, we can a accomplish professional-grade research results. And this allows us to ask you to come in Mark the craters. Get the people who attend your event, events to come in, map out the crater ejecta. And together, we can produce published research. Um, so far, uh, we've had peer-reviewed research come out of two of our projects. We have aided in discovering a number of Kuiper Belt objects working with the New Horizons team back when we first launched in 2012. And our Moon Mappers project, we did a paper that st did the statistical analysis comparing the results of a randomly selected group of amateurs with a group of eight professionals, some of whom have actually been working on mapping worlds since the days of Apollo. And this is where we discovered that uh, we can be just as, as good as professionals as, as the amateurs are doing this. Um, one thing I flag here that, that we've learned is researchers are really good at mentoring this community in their spare time. And this is something you're all probably aware of. You've wor probably worked with a lot of random professional scientists over the years. And we're often easy to get a hold of if you want to ask a quick question. But it takes a whole lot of time and effort to publish research. And one of the reasons that CosmoQuest doesn't have a lot of published papers until um, we just don't have a lot of published papers, is because we haven't had until recently the funding to get our scientists the time they need to publish papers. Uh, thanks to NASA, we are currently funded, and we have these yellow lines again. I apologize for the random attack of the yellow lines. Um, we, we now have NASA funding that is going to allow us to build a regular series of new citizen science projects. and pay the scientists who are working on mentoring these projects to see all of the efforts that are being put in by the citizen scientists and the amateur scientists to see all of those efforts turned into published research. So we expect to see in the coming years a rapid succession of new papers coming out and going into publication. Now, beyond uh, all of this, a lot of you probably need to find activities occasionally because we're, we're trying to inspire people to, to get involved and 
let's face it, there's lines for telescopes in addition to periodic bad weather. And it's good to use this time to get people learning. The Night Sky Network provides amazing kits. And in fact, CosmoQuest is, is getting some of the people behind those Night Sky Network kits to also build us kits. Um, and in addition to kits, we're also working to put together a variety of lesson plans that you might be able to steal parts of to use when you're working with school groups. One of the ones that's particularly designed for this is our astrology, astronomy, astronomy, astrology lesson. This is one that was put together uh, to be used as a public activity that teaches, well, why some of the basic ideas behind the astrological uh, interpretation of the zodiac just don't quite make sense. One of the things that we go into, for instance, is uh, in, in astrology, they have all the constellations equally spaced out, but as you guys know, it turns out some of the constellations are really thin and the moon doesn't spend a lot of time in them and the sun doesn't spend a lot of time in them. But some of the constellations are much bigger. And there's actually a really cool activity in this where you get people to form a circle and they start out all equally spaced out. And then based on saying that each part of their body is, I think, five degrees, they span themselves out so that they're spread out big if they're one of the bigger constellations or they're just scrunched down to just their body width for the smaller constellations. And you can get a sense of well, the sun doesn't actually line up with these constellations for equal amounts of time in the real astronomical way of looking at our, at our changing sky. Now, I, I know already from your emails that some of you are going ahead and you're listening to our podcasts. One of the things that we've been putting together uh, since 2009 is the 365 Days of Astronomy podcast series. This podcast series uh, brings a myriad of different voices from our shared community straight to your headphones and speakers. Uh, this is a project that, in fact, we welcome any of you to contribute to. Uh, we've had a lot of really good podcasts sent to us by Night Sky Network and Solar System Ambassador members over the years that we're very pleased with. Um, this is a place where you can go if you want to find 30 minutes of audio on cultural astronomy, if you want to get a monthly update on what's in the sky right now that you can have playing in the background. We have Astronomy Cast and the Weekly Space Hangout are both getting uh, played through 365 Days of Astronomy. So this is a research resource that we put together so that, well, you have that audio you can play at star parties or other events um, to, again, peep, keep people engaged while you might be trying to operate a telescope and not able to talk with everyone who's there. Now, if any of you out there have your own interest in participating as a podcaster in 365 Days of Astronomy, we are in the process of looking, looking for new podcasters. We will be continuing into 2017. So drop me an email at info at 365daysofastronomy.org and we can work on scheduling your show for the coming year. Now, beyond audio, beyond lesson plans. Um, we know that some of you are even lucky enough to either have your club uh, at a planetarium or be associated with a portable blow-up planetarium. And one of the things that we're working on putting together is a repository of stock images that aren't your everyday stock images of woman with coffee cup, but rather they're stock images that are taken with spherical uh, fisheye lenses that look at our world and create images that can be projected onto domes, onto science on the sphere units, and allow us um, to basically see everything from the rocket park at Kennedy Space Center to the, the area outside the door of Gemini Telescope at Mauna Kea, um, as it would appear if you were there while you're simply staying at home in your dome. This stock repository is, is something that 
if you are someone who creates your own content or if you are someone who likes to work with the uh, new Google uh, Cardboard, uh, it turns out the same images that get taken to be used in planetariums and be used on science on the sphere units can also be rendered to be viewed through Google Cardboard. Um, our image repository is going to have images that you can download. And if you haven't tried Google Cardboard at a Night Sky Network event, um, it's worth Googling. The, the way Google Cardboard works is you take a regular phone, can be Android, can be iPhone. Um, Google is nicely agnostic most of the time. And you can either download plans for a fold-up cardboard device, or you can just order them off the internet. And when you fold up the cardboard viewer, you can hold it up. And when you look through it, it divides the screen. So your left eye and your right eye are looking at two different things. And this allows you to have a virtual reality experience using just your phone and not having to invest in something like Oculus Rift. The New York Times has been producing all sorts of amazing content for Google Cardboard. And CosmoQuest is getting ready to get into producing content for Google Cardboard as well. And there are already other folks out there. Uh, Ricardo Garcia at Astronomy Brazil has already been producing these. Um, there are some amazing observatory tours that allow you to essentially stand on remote mountaintops with your Google Cardboard. And as you move your head to look around, you can look down at, well, not your feet, but the feet of whoever took the images and literally see yourself on the top of a mountain covered in observatories you may have always dreamed of seeing. Um, these are new experiences that new technology is allowing. And you can take the people who are coming to your Night Sky Network event from looking through your 12-inch your Mead, your uh, 6-inch Dobsonian, those are always my favorite. Take them from looking through your telescope and seeing Saturn for the first time. And, and we all know that amazing moment when someone sees it and they're like, is this real? And they look through the front of the telescope to try and find that like magazine cutout you've hidden there. We can take them from going and saying, this is what my telescope can see. Now just imagine what you can do with one of these four meter, one of these 10 meter telescopes that exist in Chile, in Hawaii. And then you can pull out your Google Cardboard, just your cell phone and some folded up cardboard. And you can say, let's, let's go there. Let's look at these distant telescopes. And then let's look at the distant universe as it's seen through these telescopes. This is the future that we're working to help enable with CosmoQuest. And, and we're really here to build things that, that will help you communicate your universe. And I'm seeing that there's, there's two questions, so I'm going to come in and see what the questions are. John Carter says, uh, you might be able to get rid of those yellow lines by changing the view mode to play. So, so the reason I'm not in play is if I go into play mode, um, it doesn't share my screens correctly because I have two monitors and Zoom just can't cope with that. Um, so thank you for trying to help. Um, usually I'm really good about remembering to turn off all the guides ahead of time. Um, apparently this particular slide deck had some guides turned on that I didn't know about. So sorry about that. Um, so that has been answered. Um, and then John Carter says, are there really only 88 constellations? No, I think that's actually 88 in one of the two hemispheres. Um, but someone else can probably answer that better than me. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, so I'm, I'm now looking to see what's going on in the other chat. Um, 
<laughs> and I hear someone saying, any way to add light music behind the talk, maybe Holst Venus jazz, Star Trek themes. Um, I, you know, that would be kind of awesome. Um, I do have the technology to do that mixing, but I didn't set it up for this evening. Um, and um, oh, Stuart is saying there's only 88 constellations. Are you sure? I'm... I'm confused. Okay. Um, I, for some reason, thought there was over 100. But, you know, the awesome thing about being a scientist is you're constantly trying to learn new things, but occasionally you're wrong, and you're always willing to be corrected when you're wrong. So, so, um, so apparently the IAU made it official. There's only 88 constellations in the whole sky. Okay. So uh, learn something you didn't know for certain every day. Um, so, so with Cosmic Quest, we're, we're a community. Um, what we do is all about getting people engaged and helping leverage the public to help us explore our universe and providing folks like you who can be our interface to that public with the tools you need to be more successful in everything you do. Now, we couldn't do what we're doing. Um, if we didn't have ways to build communities. Um, so, so on one hand, we go out just like you do, and we do what we call guerrilla science. This is like one of my favorite things is when we go to the local custard stand and we set up a bunch of telescopes and a booth in the, the parking lot of the uh, medical center next to the custard stand when it's closed. And then everyone with their sticky hands, we ask to please not touch the telescopes. Everyone comes over and they smell like chocolate and they just want to look at the stars. And it's really kind of awesome. And so we go out, we do stage shows, we do talks, we do what we call on the Rome science. This is when uh, we'll go up to people at bus stops and say, hi, do you have time for a moment of science with our iPads? And ask them to get engaged. And we also work to get involved in the massive um, national and international efforts that I know the Night Sky Network is often part of. So we work with Global Astronomy Month. We work with International Observe the Moon Night. We work with Yuri's Night to try and find CosmoQuest activities that can tie in specifically with these large events. So I would encourage you as you're working to plan your local events that tie into things like International Observe the Moon Night to take a moment to check out CosmoQuest's blog and Twitter feed and see, hey, is there anything extra you can bring that um, might help out um, with, with what you're doing. I say I have more questions. So Susie's saying over 100 Messier objects, but just 88 constellations. That, that makes sense. Um, I, I have to admit I've spent much more time trying to find all of my Messier objects with binoculars than I have looking at what the constellations they're in are called. Um, so um, then Lori uh, Gunter, I think, is asking, um, is space time the same as military or civilian time? Um, that one's kind of complicated to answer. So, um, and, and the reason I'm saying it, it's complicated to answer is, is when we talk about space time, um, usually what we're talking about is universal time, which is time that is based off of what time is it um, in Greenwich, England, not accounting for daylight savings time? Or we're talking about sidereal time, which is time according to where the stars are, and it counts zero according to what's overhead in Greenwich on the equinox in the fall. Um, so these two particular different ways of looking at time um, the military does use universal time sometimes when they're trying to coordinate global activities. You might have sometimes heard this called Zulu time. Um, but sidereal time, which has to do with which stars are straight overhead in Greenwich on the equinox, uh, it has nothing to do with military time. So the answer varies depending on context. Um, so Susie Gerton is asking, when using CosmoQuest and Outreach, do you still have individuals register um, or do you collect data under a generic login? So, so I have to admit, we do still make people log in. 
Um, but one of the things that you can do is you can create a login for your club. And the reason we do this is because it allows us to look at statistics and figure out this person, this person rocks at everything they do. This person's values we can give higher trustworthiness to. Um, whereas like if you look at the stuff that's coming out of my account, there's a whole lot of museum visitors who have clicked all sorts of randomness. And so all of my data really just needs to be thrown away. And because I'm logged in when that's happening, we can look at the data and go, ooh, ooh, that, that matches nothing. That person is a crazy person or a five-year-old. Um, this, this person is awesome. We love everything they do. And, and, and so you, you do have to log in. Um, so Andrea Schweitzer says, it is great to see programs that were originally tied with the International Year of Astronomy uh, that have continued for so many years. Do you have a favorite story for how your programs have grown since then? Oh, man. Um, so so I, I have to admit that, that I know Andrea through uh, our involvement in the International Year of Astronomy. She was the project manager for the U.S. efforts, and I was the webmaster for the U.S. efforts, as well as being the uh, co-chair of the International Task Force on New and Social Media, um, back before we had a word for social media, and we just called it all new media. Um, and And... This was this was an event that completely changed my career because prior to that I'd just been a variable star astronomer who taught at a small university. And for me, being engaged in the International Year of Astronomy made it possible for me to meet people all around the world and start projects that me here in Southern Illinois, uh, Aviva Yamani, uh, out in Indonesia, um, Rosa Doran in Portugal, none of us could have done what we were trying to do if it was just each of us in our somewhat isolated locations. By all of us using digital media to communicate, we built friendships, we built infrastructure. In one case, uh, Kevin Govender and Carolina Odman built a family. Um, on the connections that that we made during IYA and we are still growing and evolving the projects that started and I, I can't say that I have any one favorite moment but what I have is a favorite feeling and that's that feeling of running into people yet again on a new continent and seeing all of us well grow our field together um, it's, it's amazing how you get involved in something and you don't really know where it's going. Um, so Jill Zomp asks, Does Cosm do CosmoQuest activities work on mobile devices like smartphones and iPads for things like marking craters and other peer-reviewed projects? Um, we have some activities uh, that we release usually to closed groups of people that work on the iPhone. Um, we're looking to do broader distributions in the future. Um, we're still in the process of getting all of our NASA money lined up, um, and, and that Apple developer license has been killing us. Um, this will all be fixed in the new year. Uh, so you, we will have mobile apps at that point. Um, everything we have works but doesn't work well on the iPad. And the reason it doesn't work well is it turns out that just dragging with your finger to to create a circle um, on the iPad, it's it's not the most precise process because we have fat fingers. Um, if you use a stylus, they work much better. Um, we're working to come up with ways to better leverage mobile devices. It's, it's a frustration that we're all fully aware of. Um, so Stuart Myers asks, in an earlier slide, you mentioned about doing activities at science fiction conventions and fantasy conventions. I'm curious if you have heard any stories about how any celebrity convention guests reacted to said activities. Oh, I actually have an awesome, awesome uh, two stories related to this. Um, the first one is I found myself uh, in the green room at Pensacon. Um, with pile of astronomy stuff next to me, 
desperately drinking very hot coffee because I was very sick and I needed the coffee to survive. I don't know if any of you have gotten sick while traveling and coffee is all you need in the whole wide world. And while I was sitting there, Richard Hatch, who was the original Apollo on the original Battlestar Galactica when I was a small child and was my original first celebrity crush when I was a small child, sat down next to me and I got to explain to him while I had a fragment of the Chelyabinsk asteroid with me, not Chelyabinsk asteroid, the Chelyabinsk meteorite with me, that the Chelyabinsk meteorite was made by an Apollo class asteroid, asteroid small thing that decided that it was going to enter our atmosphere. So explaining to the original Apollo that Chelyabinsk got hit by an Apollo class object was very cool. Um, another awesome moment was back in 2009, I had a Galileo scope that I was working to get signed by celebrities to raise money for IYA. And I was standing backstage with a bunch of the Battlestar Galactica people. You might be sensing a theme here. And the actor who played Ty in the modern Battlestar Galactica franchise saw the Galileo scope and lit up. And he's like, I was just reading about those. And I was like, I can tell you about this. And um, so celebrities are just people like us who happen to do cool things on television. And just like the normal distribution of human beings, some of them are not nice and some of them are fabulous. And at science fiction conventions, you often meet truly fabulous celebrities who just want to geek out about science stuff, just like we do. Um, that was far too long of an answer for that question. Um, so uh, Joseph Martinez asks, can multiple users utilize the same account simultaneously in CosmoQuest? Yes. Yes, they can. So this means that if your Night Sky Network uh, group wants to set up your own login, set it up on multiple computers, our software will say nothing bad about this. Um, go for it. Um, and then um, Nathan Brock asks, do you anticipate the next fiscal year budget to change? If so, how? Um, that is so far above my pay grade. I, I cannot, I'm sorry. There's certain things that I have to say are even beyond my ability to guess, um, especially in an election year. Um, so, so those are the questions. So, so the the slide that I currently have up is is like I was saying, we're working to build community, and and so we're here to help. We are in the process of launching new forums that should make it easier to communicate and. Um, we are going to maintain our current forums. So some of you may know that uh, many, 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 many moons ago, uh, Phil Plate started the Bad Astronomy Forums. Um, a few moons after that, Fraser Kane started the Universe Today Forums. About four years after that, uh, Bad Astronomy and Universe Today combined into the single Bad Astronomy Universe Today Forums which then joined forces with Astronomy Cast, which then got moved over to CosmoQuest. And so we have this megalith of forums that have been around for, I think, 14 or 15 years. And they're daunting. You, you look at them and people don't know how to get engaged. And, and they're also built on older technologies that hackers enjoy hacking. Um, so we're in the process of, of, we've set those forums up on their own servers. We are going to maintain them. Nothing will be changing. But we're going to be adding new forums that are designed strictly for the CosmoQuest community members who are taking place in the outreach activities, taking place in the education programs, getting involved, taking classes with our Cosmo Academy programs. And, and we invite you to come in. We're going to have all of this launch in the next couple of weeks. We invite all of you to come in and, and get involved in, in our new forums. And another thing that I didn't have a chance to bring up, and I'm going to bring this up before I run out of time, um, we do have online learning classes. Uh, we are going to be launching a whole slate of classes starting in January. We're pretty much closed down for the fall right now. 
And when Cosmo Academy launches, it's, it's your own Brian Cruz who is here earlier this evening who's going to be one of the folks helping us schedule all of these classes. These, these do cost money unless you're a teacher. Um, but the amount that we charge is actually based on how much it takes for me to take horseback riding lessons and for friends of mine to take dance lessons. So these are cost they're, they're, they're costed out competitive with other adults. We want someone to help us learn thing activities. And just like when I take a horseback riding lesson, there's only going to be like eight horses in the arena because otherwise death. Um, with Cosmo Academy, we want you to be able to learn as much as possible. So we keep the course size small. So um, we have classes that are 5 to 10, 10 to 15, and 15 to 20 um, enrollees. And, and this gives you a chance to have a small class experience on the internet instead of one of these massive online courses. We're, we're trying to make it so that you get to talk and have interactions and debates and conversations as part of your class where active learning, the, the kind of learning that we all actually want where you're engaged in the data, engaged in the lesson. We're trying to create all of that using online learning spaces. So if you're interested and you do have the resources to, to pay to take classes, um, we'll be offering these starting in January. So stay tuned and check out CosmoQuest. And we see another question coming in. Anonymous viewer asks, do the people who help with the peer-reviewed projects get credit when it comes to when it becomes published research. Yes. Um, so our, uh, the Kuiper Belt objects that we discovered, uh, the Minor Planet Center Bulletin actually lists over 500 names where everyone who was involved in the search got their name on the paper um, if they had successfully identified an a object that was discovered. Um, so, yes, and, and what's cool is with the Kuiper Belt objects, these are things that we were looking for in multiple images to confirm the orbit. So there was the 15 people that noticed it in the first set of images. There was the 15 people that noticed it in the next set of images. And so it turns out we were able to give everyone who was involved in marking where those objects were in each of the different images used to calculate the orbits, all of those people got credit. Now, when we publish all of our papers, we, we can't, due to page limitations, list every single name. So what we will do is anyone who is involved in either discovering a key object that's being discussed or anyone who's involved in the analysis will be listed on the publication and there will be a link to the website that allows people to explore who has done what through our galleries and other features. Um, so uh, Joseph Martinez asks, when you indicate teachers for Cosmo Academy, are these certified K through 12 teachers or will they include informal educators that do after school programs? Um, currently, we only have enough money to offer uh, K through 12 teachers who are at public institutions um, or private accredited institutions um, scholarships. Now, the thing about Cosmo Academy is that the, the tuition that we ask people to pay um, if we get the minimum enrollment on a class is exactly enough money to cover all of our bills after we're done paying the teacher, um, paying uh, someone like Brian to help us with the management, paying our server bills. But if there's a class of five to 10 people, and instead of getting five people signed up, we get all 10 signed up, that means we earn a little bit of money. And that money can get turned over. And the more classes we teach and the more of that money can get turned over, the more people we can offer scholarships to. So this is the kind of project that if it's successful, we'll be able to open the doors for more and more educators, including those in Girl Scouts and Boy Scout programs and other after-school programs, the chance to take classes. Um, so Anonymous Viewer is also asking who teaches the courses. It's all professional scientists. Uh, so we've had Emily Lakdawalla teach in the past, uh, Dr. Dr. Matthew Francis, who's a cosmologist. We do have some individuals who only have master's degrees. So Ray Sanders, who you may know as Cosmic Ray, um, he taught our introductory courses. Um, 
But in general, we try and find who is the person who has the best combination of content knowledge and communication skills. So we're, we're looking specifically for instructors who, who know how to communicate because we've all had that bad professor and Cosmo Academy is doing everything it can to make sure you never get that bad professor. Um, Lori Gauthier, uh, sorry, Lori Guntner is asking, is Cosmo Academy me for all ages? I, we really kind of assume that the folks taking it have completed high school. Um, and we do have some classes where we'll put prereqs or more advanced math understanding. Um, it's designed for adults. It's taught in the evening. But if you have there's always a chance for there to be exceptions. So don't be afraid to reach out to us. I would say if you have a gifted and talented K through 12 student to look for programs uh, through either the Johns Hopkins Center for Talented Youth or the Davidson Institute Program for Gifted and Talented because it's always good for gifted and talented kids to get to work with their peers. And, and both the Johns Hopkins Centers for Talented Youth and the Davidson Institute for Gifted and Talented are, are amazing programs filled with amazing kids. And I know that, that having taught for them, it's awesome to watch. And as someone whose life was changed by being in gifted and talented programs at MIT, it's so important to get kids a peer group. Um, I have five minutes left. Um, David, Brian, do you want to pop in? Is there anything that you need to bring up before the hour ends? We had, uh, we're going to be doing a raffle uh, at the end and uh, just a couple of uh, end announcements at the uh, uh, when you're done. So if we, you know, I know that you've had a very long day and you're in a different <laughs> time zone than we are. And so, uh, we, so we have uh, questions coming in, we're, we're happy to entertain them. So, so I'm just going to tell everyone, go to CosmoQuest.org. This, this screen has the URL on it. Go to CosmoQuest.org. And what's cool is if you go the go there this week, you get to watch the sausage being made. Uh, we're in the process of rolling out a completely new website. So literally every half hour, the site is probably going to have at least one thing that is new and has never been there before. Um, things are going to break along the way. So there's an under construction warning just about everywhere. Um, but this is your chance to come in and get in at the ground floor as we start a whole new era with CosmoQuest under our new cooperative agreement with NASA. Um, William Mer Merman is asking, how can I get my astronomy club involved in these programs? Write me a letter, starstrider at gmail.com, and I'll brainstorm with you. Every club has different needs and different ways to get involved. So unfortunately, um, there's no one-size-fits-all answer, but I'm happy to brainstorm with people. Um, Tom Totem is asking, where are planetarium images available, Digistar 5 compatible? Um, we have full dome masters that can be downloaded for up to 4K projectors. Um, I think that's compatible with the Digistar 5. You may have to do some rendering on your own end of dome masters, but that's pretty standard. Um, they're available on our Science on the Sphere um, website. If you go to CosmoQuest.org slash X, we have our new menu systems available there. And one of the menu options says for kids and parents, uh, museums, scientists, teachers, in some order of those words, um, that drop-down menu lists the repositories. And we even have a free planetarium show available under Creative Commons licensing. So go grab the content, remix, reuse, spread science. Anything else you guys want to bring up? Just me of the blessings of the Lord's a cobal with the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the only Battles of Galactica fan, so say we all. <laughs> so say we all. So say we all. I got to trick my roommates into watching it um, early. It was somehow in Australia, like three months before it ever aired in the U.S. Wow. I grabbed it, and I was like, so we're, we're watching this new drama. <laughs> and they got sucked in. It was hilarious. And great. 
But yeah, thank you so much for, for the talk. And we'll definitely be putting this up on YouTube for folks to check out. And we'll be putting links to CosmoQuest all over the Night Sky Network in our related articles. So thank That you. sounds great. Thank you yeah. so much, David. You'll definitely be able, to be able to find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network uh, uh, under the Outreach Resources section. Just search for webinar. And tonight's presentation, as David mentioned, will go up on the Night Sky Network YouTube page by the end of the week. For you